This is the expedition through Exodus, going chapter by chapter through the book of Exodus, not verse by verse here, but chapter by chapter, seeing what we can see in each chapter for the most part. And in chapters 1 through 2, we saw where Israel is in bondage to Egypt under a horrible ruler named Pharaoh. And this pictures the sinner in bondage to the world and sin under the God of this world, the devil. Chapters 3 through 6, you see the Lord preparing a deliverer because Israel has cried out. And you'll see this a lot. Israel is in bondage to some wicked guy. They cry out to the Lord. God sends a deliverer. And this time it's going to be Moses. And you see him approach the wicked ruler Pharaoh in these chapters. And Moses pictures Jesus Christ who delivers the sinner from the bondage of the world. Egypt is a picture of the world. So Moses delivering Israel from Egypt pictures Jesus delivering us from the world. Then you see chapter 7 through 12 where God brings the plagues on Egypt and Pharaoh. And this pictures the plagues that would take place on the Antichrist in the tribulation. Pharaoh is the top of the Antichrist. And Moses also will come back as one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 to go against the Antichrist himself. Now Pharaoh does everything he can to keep Israel in Egypt, just like the devil does everything he can to keep the sinner in the world. And in chapter 12 you had the Passover. They put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, and this pictures Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, and this pictures our redemption. They applied the blood of the lamb. You need to get the blood applied to your soul. Jesus died for you. He shed his blood for you. He paid your payment for sin with his own blood. So you just got to accept the payment. So it's like this. You were in bondage to the world, like Israel, under the devil, they were under Pharaoh. The Lord sent you a deliverer, Jesus Christ, just like he sent them Moses. The devil did everything he could to keep you in the world, just like Pharaoh did everything he could to keep them in Egypt. But you accepted the deliverer, and you applied the precious blood of the lamb and got redeemed. So you see the picture so far? Now we move into chapter 13, and look what it starts off with. Sanctification. See, if chapter 12 pictured salvation where you were sanctified once and for all, I would guess the next chapters would picture daily sanctification. Every day you need to sanctify yourself. Now, when it comes to your salvation, you've already been sanctified. You're sanctified forever, once and for all. Nothing can change it. But when it comes to your daily walk in this flesh, you need to sanctify yourself. So, chapter 13... Look what it starts off with in Exodus 13, 1 through 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. Sanctified means set apart. The moment you got saved, you did sanctif get sanctified. That is, set apart. But after you're saved, you need a daily Sanctification. You need to start separating yourself from the world. In Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So don't be just like the world. Separate. You got to be in the world, but not of the world. In Exodus 13, 18, it says, But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So you're going to see one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, the Red Sea parting. And it actually took place, despite of what all those smart, professed smart people say. It says in Exodus 13, 19, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones away hence with you. Joseph pictures Jesus Christ. So this pictures his bones not staying in the world. Because Joseph's bones weren't going to stay in Egypt, a picture of the world. And the same Lord that leads them out of Egypt is the same Lord that will guide you through the wilderness. They're going to go on this wilderness journey and he's going to guide them all the way through. 
In Exodus 13, 21 through 22, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So just like how the Holy Spirit does inside you, it is with us in the day, it's with us in the night, it never leaves. It's there by day, it's there by night, and if you w listen to it through the scriptures, figure out what it wants you to do, it's, it's guiding you constantly. So chapter 13 is about sanctifying. Chapter 14, this is where Pharaoh follows Israel and overtakes them by the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army. And in this chapter, you got a picture of water baptism. In Exodus 14, 9, But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Belzephon. Pharaoh trusts in his horses and chariots, you see. He's got them all together. He believes their strength in numbers. That is why he was so intimidated by Israel, because they were growing into a huge population of people, waxing exceeding mighty and increasing and being fruitful. So he was intimidated. That's why he made it so, one reason he made it so hard on him in the first place. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in, this, in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Moses pictures the Savior. And sometimes the new convert doesn't understand why the Savior does what he does. Just like they're asking... Moses, why did you do this? Why are we here? Why are we in front of the Red Sea and about to be trampled by this army? Sometimes an older convert doesn't even understand why the Lord does what he does. But doing what the Lord says, you always get through it. And you always come out better. It says in Exodus 14, 12, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Sometimes, when the going gets tough in the Christian life, a Christian starts missing the world. You, you start missing it. They're thinking about how their life was back when they were serving the, serving the Egyptians. For some reason, they think that it was good for some reason. But the, they must be forgetting the rigor and the hard bondage. Sometimes you, when you're saved, you think about how it was before you were saved, and you the devil only brings to your mind the good things that happened before you were saved, so you start missing your old life. But then you have Moses, a picture of the Savior, who will show you something amazing, and something to show that you shouldn't fear anymore. Exodus 14, 13 through 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. So the Lord shall fight for you. Being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, he will fight your battles. You just got to show up. Just show up. That's uh, what you got to do. He'll fight it for you. In uh, Exodus fourteen fifteen, the Lord said to Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speaking to the children of Israel, that they go forward. Moses, as the shepherd, needs to encourage the sheep to go forward, not backward. It's the false prof false shepherd who claims defeat or claims that God won't bring you through it, and he wants you to go backward. If uh, Moses was a false shepherd, he would say, uh, we can't go through the Red Sea, we'll just go back. But he didn't do that. It says in Exodus 14, 16 through 18, But lift up thou up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it. 
and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Pharaoh, you see, was trusting in himself, and his chariots, and in his horses. He was trusting in arms of flesh. He wasn't giving credit to the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. You know, he, he believed in many gods. So he would have believed that their god was just an ordinary old god, and probably by his experience with gods, they usually don't come through anyway. But it says in Exodus 14, 19 through 20, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. They had the Lord as their bodyguard. Just like nobody can snatch you out of the body of Christ, the Lord is his own bodyguard. He guards the body of Christ. Nobody can pluck you out of his hand. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. So kind of like walking through one of those tunnels at the aquarium is what you got here. I imagine they looked to the side, and they had fish swimming all around them. On the, on, they could see in those... Though that wall on the left and that wall on the right of that body of water, they could see whatever was in the bottom of that water. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. You would think they would know better. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked into the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drove them heavily so their wheels fall off. So now the, their horses are just pulling on all that dead weight so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. So they even see it. They even see that there's something supernatural going on here finally. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. The Egyptians didn't really have too much sense, you see. If Israel's God could part the waters, wouldn't that let you know you shouldn't mess with the God of Israel and that you shouldn't try to follow them into this huge body of water that he just parted to help them escape from you? You see, just like the devil knows the power of God, yet he still fights against God. Pride is a dangerous thing that can lead you to do really stupid stuff just like Pharaoh. Now, that was chapter 14. And what that pictures is your water baptism. Because Paul actually calls this a water baptism. Oh, he, does, he, he doesn't call it a water baptism. He calls it a, a baptism. Obviously not a water one because they didn't even get wet. But uh, you see, there's more than one baptism in the Bible. And here, you know what Paul says about it? it he says in 1 Corinthians 10.2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So they were baptized unto Moses, showing you that baptism is about affiliation. They were baptized unto Moses. This affiliated them with Moses. Those uh, disciples of John were baptized unto John's baptism. That affiliated them with John the Baptist. Me and you, we get believer's baptism where we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that affiliates us with the Lord. So you see, what's the one of the things you need what are the things you need to do after you get saved? Daily sanctification. You need to get water baptized. And then the next thing here you'll see 
And chapter 15, that's going to go right along with it, is when you get saved, you get a new song. So in chapter 15, you got a new song, the song of Moses. And so hopefully you've got a new song in your heart after you got saved. In Exodus 15, 1, it says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. For he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now notice the greatest thing you can do in a song is brag on the Lord. The songs today are really unclear about how they are, you know, who they're praising. It could be about their boyfriend, for all we know, about their girlfriend. Because, you know, they're not really saying the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saying him. And um, that's just very unclear. In Exodus 15, 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. You see, what had, what had, um, what had Egypt been doing? They had been drowning the male babies in a river. They shouldn't have messed with those little ones. So they sank to the bottom as a stone. What does Mark 9, 42 said? And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Exodus 15, 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. That right hand in the Bible. Jesus Christ sits at the right hand. He is the right hand man. Notice in the Bible that the right hand is generally good and the left hand is generally bad. But it says, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. No man's and no one's arm is stronger than the Lord's. And there's this picture of Jesus Christ arm wrestling the devil to hint that the devil has the slightest chance or could even move the Lord's arm is just foolish thinking. It's not going to happen. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Exodus 15, 7, And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, with wrath which consumed them as stubble. Consumed them. Our God is a consuming fire. He can consume you with water. He can consume you with the earth itself, as he did with Korah. He can consume you with fire. Exodus 15, 8, And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. So it's just like God just breathed and made all this happen. All he had to do was just breathe. It says in Exodus 15, 10, Thou didst blow with thy wind, and the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. So who is like the Lord among the gods? The answer is none of them. He just brought all those plagues on the gods of Egypt in chapter 7 through 12. And the gods aren't just figments of people's imagination. These are real gods. Most likely, the gods connected with the fallen angels and unclean spirits. You read in Psalm 82, 6 through 7, I have said, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Most likely, these gods that you're reading about in the Old Testament are fallen angels that came down and ended up getting worship just like the devil wants to get, get worship. They wanted worship because, you know, they're str uh, str uh, more strong in power and might than people, so people would look up to them if they came down. And it, it makes you wonder, you know, are these false gods like Moloch, was that at one time uh, a... Just some type of fallen angel or something that came down and got worship. And then they made a statue of it and everything else. But these gods, these little G gods, weren't just figments of the imagination. Now, they, 
they couldn't save you. They couldn't save the Egyptians, obviously. They couldn't stop the plagues from coming, obviously. But they weren't just figments of their imagination. But And the Lord defeated them all. And he wasn't just defeating some imaginary thing. It was God taking on all these little G-gods at once and defeating them all. Just like when he was on the cross. You know, he said, who shall contend with me? All these unclean spirits and the devil himself was raging against him. These uh, talk, talking like bulls of, of Bashan uh, raging against him. You know, in Psalm 22, and he defeated them all. So, that's um, a few things from the book of Exodus. Let's go ahead and get chapter 16 as well. In chapter 16, Israel murmurs and wants to go back to Egypt. They're hungry, so the Lord rains down bread from heaven. He rains down manna. This pictures the bread from heaven, Jesus Christ, the living word. And it also pictures the written word, the word of God. So another thing, what's another thing you need to do? After you get saved, you need to sing a new song and you need to dive into the word of God. In Exodus 16, 2, it says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. See, they were murmuring, complaining, grumbling over and over again. If you'll get into the scriptures and read them daily, it will decrease your complaining and your murmuring. You'll become more thankful, more appreciative about things. And the children of Israel said to them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So you see, they see the present trouble and think they had, to, had, they had it better back in Egypt. Sometimes you can forget just how bad things were in your old life. You see, the devil only reminds you of the good parts, as I said before. That's what makes you want to go back. You're forgetting how bad it was. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So food is coming from the sky. And I've seen this plot stolen in Hollywood several times. For example, cloudy with a chance of meatballs, food falling from the sky. I remember that genie movie with Shaq, that I watched as a little kid in the 90s where he caused junk food to rain from the sky. Here, you got manna falling from the sky for Israel to eat. And the manna pictures the word of God. And you need to get a certain rate every day. You need to be going out and gathering some every day. Get the word of God in you every day. And Exodus 16.31, The house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like a coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. See that? Made with honey. Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Exodus 16, 35, And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited that eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. So eat the manna, until you reach your destination. Take in a certain rate every day. Read it and read it and don't stop reading it. But this has been an expedition through Exodus.